Okay, hi from me and welcome to this session. I am very happy that I'm here with you and uh, I will try to share my experience and best practices from the enterprise companies that I have worked already with Azure. I hope that you already have some knowledge regarding the Azure and that's why I will try just to be to point the most important topics in the next uh, 30 minutes. Okay then, I am Fisnik Doko. I work as a cloud architect in the last uh, four years. I am also Microsoft certified trainer for eight years, delivering courses around Europe. Before that, I have been a .NET developer, working for different companies, and also a board member in the .NET user group in Macedonia and the Asia user group in Macedonia. I am certified from Microsoft. I have uh, more than 50 badges from Microsoft. I try to, to learn new, new things and with that to make the life as an IT engineer uh, easier. In the last years I have worked for uh, different companies uh, remotely, uh, companies starting from uh, Pfizer, Maersk in Denmark, uh, power energy companies in uh, Europe and working as an architect and delivering successfully solutions. That's why I will try now in the following minutes to, to point these uh, important, important, let's say, things for different resources where I, be, I will be concentrated mostly for uh, developer resources. Because in Azure we have like uh, hundreds of resources. The idea will be just the focus on uh, developer resources. It means you as developer, what you should use and when using such resources, what uh, configuration or tuning to do there. We will start first with uh, the hosting of uh, various applications. Then we will see some uh, database uh, options there. And also we will see some other optional parts which are mostly for uh, enhancing uh, the applications and making them, let's say, uh, more reliable, faster, and reachable all around the world. I will start first with the app service. Azure App Service is one of the most pillars of Azure for hosting uh, different applications. When talking for different applications, since, uh, let's say, eight years ago and more, it's supported in the same resource to host different technologies, like starting from uh, .NET, Java, Python, uh, PHP, and other technologies, all can be hosted here. Like, what are the most important features here in Azure App Service. In Azure App Service, despite various, let's say, technologies, here automatically Microsoft manages, manages that platform as a service. Once monthly, they do update of that. We don't see nothing. And we as developers just push our code there and it will work. Despite that, it has very good integration with Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and other uh, integrated development environments. Also, it has very good support for CI/CD. Another feature that is here, like uh, interesting, is this with uh, slots. It means in one app service, in that compute, let's say, a resource, we can create many slots, and on those slots we can test other environments. It has also drawbacks because if you are on production and if you have a compute intensive application, that slot can affect your production environment. That, let's say, you need to be, to be uh, clear about that and uh, to be careful if you have especially like sidecore applications, you cannot put in slot because one sidecore application will take many gigabytes of RAM and then to simulate this with slots or environments, you will need multiple uh, app services to simulate that. Another part is uh, uh, scaling. It can scale automatically. You can just configure, let's say, in the portal or with infrastructure as a code that, that if the CPU will be more than 90% for 10 minutes, scale up. Scale up for one machine, two machines, up to 10 or 20 machines. It means it's very easy to scale up. You don't need to create any load balancer. Automatically, will scale up, scale down. You can also put fixed scaling when it should happen. And with that, you will uh, let's say, go, don't carry regarding the, the load that will come throughout the day. Despite that, it has feature for uh, APIs and uh, mobile backends. It means app services as such is mainly used for uh, backend server technologies. You can also 
host their, let's say, React and other front-end applications, but mostly it's for a back-end technologies. As a such, also, you can put in the functions. We will see that on the next slides. Like what you need to, to be more careful when having such a infrastructure on enterprise environments. As a first, you must be sure to use just HTTPS protocol. You must be sure to turn off FTP or to turn on FTPS or disable totally FTPS. Also, very important, you should not uh, expose your application directly. It means if you host something on app service, uh, that can be used like for normal use for small businesses. But if you have a, uh, some important data or if you have a lot of visitors, you should protect this, uh, let's say, with a web application firewall, which we will see on the next slides. It means for enterprise, you should not directly expose the app service. Despite that, you can manage cross-origin resource sharing. You should disable uh, remote debugging. And also, very important, like in this resource and the other resources, is the VNet integration. The VNet integration means to be closed in the VNet, to not be directly accessible from internet. For that purpose, that can be achieved by using here so-called private endpoints. Private endpoints for inbound and for outbound here should be used the VNet integration. Uh, now it's available also in the basic plans, but it was available just in the premium plans or if you have app service created from before, you should put that uh, in a premium plan, and then after the premium plan, you can do the VNet integration. Again, VNet integration is very important for big companies. They don't want nothing to be, uh, let's say, like publicly. They want just one control ingress point and one egress where they will do a full control. Again, speaking for applications that will have a uh, thousand millions of users and will have uh, sensitive data or not sensitive data. Another very interesting uh, point for developers now lastly are the functions, Azure functions or Lambda functions in AWS because you as a developer you will just throw some code there and if anybody will not use that then you will not pay no nothing. Despite that Microsoft grants like a 1 million executions, which will take like one second per month for free. It means you can have application which will be front end something in the CDN, back end some such APIs, and you can have an application for free. Again, in enterprise environments, it cannot stay like publicly or consumption based. It must be integrated in a VNet, and that can be achieved by using a higher a pricing tire like using app service or app service plan or using a premium plan for hosting these uh, Azure functions. Azure functions as a such will have one trigger, can be HTTP trigger or can be triggered by any data insertion or uh, something else and then the function will start doing the, the logic. These are mostly event based and as a such Azure functions are uh, stateless. If you want to have some workflow or to have a stateful function, then you must use the durable functions. Durable functions are extensions of normal functions, and as such, you can create then some chain, you can create like a fan out, fan in, as such, orchestrations where you will persist data between uh, such calls and uh, such functions. In functions, you are charged for the seconds milliseconds that you execute and for the consumption of CPU and memory that you use. As a such, functions should be short and should finish. By default, the timeout of consumption based can be up to 10 minutes and if you host in, let's say, app service plan or premium plan, can take longer, but again, if you use consumption, it can be out of control if they take, if they take a long time to be executed. That's one thing. Another thing for durable functions, also another uh, option is the logic apps. Logic apps, you can create applications just with drag and drop. With drag and drop, you can create workflows, you can connect a database, you can connect to 200 and more different resources just with drag and drop, and you can create application within one day just with drag and drop without writing any line of code. That is again some workflow which will persist the state from one stage to another stage. 
Regarding the functions, you also need to be careful that if any error will happen when the function will rerun to take consideration and uh, to, to, let's say, uh, to uh, over overcome the error that already happened. Another premium, let's say, resource is the API management. API management, it is like a front end for your APIs. As a first, your APIs you will not expose publicly. It means you cannot have attacks directly to your APIs. You will put, let's say, some wall here, API management, which privately will connect to your uh, APIs and then it will expose your REST services. Despite the REST services can expose and uh, other SOAP services, what are like the benefits? The benefits is that you will have a central point for your REST services. You will have a developer portal. For every API, you can have like subscription key. You can control which client how many times will call. You can put IP filtering. You can put authentication authorization. You can convert on the fly from XML to JSON, from JSON to XML. It means that just in the portal, there are so-called policies, which policies add some functionality to already existing, let's say, uh, services. You can also add here caching. And again, when you will have a new service that will be available in this developer portal, which comes there, and you will have like a control of your APIs. Again, as an backends can be functions, can be Azure app services, can be logic apps, and then exposed through API management. Again, and API management should not be publicly available in enterprise companies. Here we put and the web application firewall, which will protect, let's see in the next slides, from the OWASP top 10 security issues. It costs the premium, it costs $4,000 and more, but again, it's used for a uh, having control regarding the APIs of the company. Very important topic while developing applications. This is like a must. You should have ingress and there you should have a control of your traffic. And this is the resource named application gateway. The magic behind this is that it has a web application firewall which has definition for OWASP top 10 security issues. And if you are not aware that you have any, let's say, uh, issue in your code or any, this will protect from SQL injection, cross-site scripting and other attacks automatically. And in that case, we will be more protected. You should use Azure application gateway if you are in one region or if you are in multiple regions, you should, you should use Azure front door. As a such, in one Azure app gateway, we can attach multiple listeners. It means multiple applications, multiple backends. It can scale out. It can do a rewrite. It can do redirection, HTTP to HTTPS. We have a logging. We can see everything, what happened, which client. We can have alerts, and etc. Again, for web applications, it is highly recommended to use a such frontend. And then the applications to be in the backend and connected just through private VNet. Very strict requirement, which is already here designed. All the applications will come in the up gateway. Up gateway will have a different here uh, backends in the private VNet. The next part, it is a new resource for since around uh, one year ago. It's the Azure Static uh, Web App. It is strictly used for front-end applications. If you have just a front-end application, you will host in Azure Static Web App, and then those files automatically will be distributed in 118 locations around the world. It means you will have automatically a CDN. You will have a front door as input. You will have your domain, and interesting, you will have a free SSL certificate by Azure. It's a cheap resource and highly recommended for uh, applications like React, Angular, Vue.js, and others. You can host those applications in any app service, but this is more dedicated. You don't need to buy a CDN or protection in front end. Automatically, it has, it has a two pricing tires, like a basic for free and standard, which costs uh, less money. Despite that, 
for every pull request that you will create, you have like a temporary URL when you, when you can test, uh, let's say, where you can test your uh, new pull request and then go uh, next. The next resource, it's very important, it's everywhere, it's the key vault for all your certificates, secrets, keys for encryption, you must use the key vault. This is the central place for the secrets. Then, in the key vault, you will put, let's say, access policy, who will have access and what access, like get, list, set, etc. After having the access in place, then you will configure your, let's say, DevOps guy will do the uh, VNet integration. And after that, here you have like a logging, who has been there for any secret, what has done, which is the IP, you have the full, let's say, auditing for the operations used here. Again, every sensitive data must be in the key vault. That is an important rule. For the key vault, you should all also enable like soft deletion, purge protection, and with that you will be safe if someone accidentally deletes that or does, let's say, any change there. Key vault, very important for developers, saving secrets, everything must be read from there. Even if you use CICD, whenever will be, all the secrets must come from the key vault. The next resource, it's regarding the message-based communication. For message-based communication, we have in Azure like a two queues, is the service bus queue and the storage queue. Service bus queue is the enterprise one. Normally it costs mostly, but it has some features that the other queue, which is storage queue, doesn't have. The storage queue as such can have a, let's say, a bigger size. But what is uh, interesting and important feature for a service bus queue, it is that it guarantees first in, first out, which for financial services is very important, and also it guarantees that the message will be delivered once and just once. It's used for decoupling systems, and the service bus can have like a queue, which is one-to-one, -one, and the topic, which is one-to-many. And here we have like VNet integration for financial services, decoupling systems, this is like a must. That is regarding the service bus. Another important topic which we have everywhere is the Azure storage. Azure storage as such, it can have like a blobs, files, queues, and has like a table where we can put a NoSQL data. For developers, the most used are the blobs. In blobs, everything that you upload in your web applications, you will put in blobs. That can be images, documents, everything will be in the blobs. What you need to do as a first, it has their option for allow public access that must be disabled, TLS must be enforced, HTTP must be enforced, shared access signature or those tokens should be minimized whenever you generate such token, you must also put there and the appropriate uh, permissions and the appropriate IP. And normally you must do VNet integration, it means those resources that we previously saw they will have the appropriate subnet, and just that subnet need to have access in your storage account. Despite this subnetting or service endpoint, always it's recommended to be with private endpoint. It means private endpoint, whichever resource will be somewhere, we can create like a private IP in any VNet that we want. And with that, it goes totally private, the appropriate resource, which is here the same and for the storage account. Again, important, very used resource for all developers is the storage account. The next topic, which you probably mostly have visited, is the Azure SQL. In Azure, there are like a three options for using SQL. The older version is by having a virtual machine with installed SQL, which is not recommended. The other version is to use Azure uh, SQL database and SQL server, which is like a pass and there is a SQL managed instance, which is again like a pass. But there are some differences between managed instance and between a single. Managed instance, it's mostly like the on-premise SQL. It has features like sending emails, it has features like a cross-database uh, communication, like queries cross-database. 
and it has like full BNet integration. But for new applications, it's recommended to use Azure uh, single, let's say Azure SQL database, which is more pass. It's not or originally like the on-premise SQL, but Microsoft manages more, Microsoft optimizes, does recommendation, and then also we can group multiple such servers in Elastic Pool for more cost efficient. In Elastic Pool, we will put, if we have like a different time zones or in different times to be used those loads, then we can be more cost efficient by using the Elastic Pool. For SQL, whichever SQL you will use, you must use auditing, you must enable the transparent data encryption, you must enable the Azure Defender. These are some must rules that in production must be there. Azure will force you to use them, but also if you use PHI data or something, you will have auditing or HIPAA high trust standards. You must do, let's say, these changes on your resources. Another resource is the PostgreSQL, which it starts to be heavily used. It is cheaper than SQL, and very important now there are two versions of Postgres. It's like a single server and a flexible server. Microsoft now forces to use a flexible server. Even some features are missing, like private endpoints and some other, still they force using the flexible server. When using a psql, Postgres, we must again enforce uh, to be in the vnet. We must enforce the TLS. We can enable Azure Active Directory administrators, or we can enable Azure Active Directory logins. It means to not create static users. The existing Azure AD users can get a token, and with that token, let's say, sign in, in Azure AD, and with that, we will have a control who has been there. Again, recommendation is to use the Azure Postgres flexible server, like two, most, two big drawbacks. It doesn't have a private endpoints, and it doesn't have a support for Azure AD authentication. The next and, let's say, important topic for databases in Azure, it, is, it exists from May 2017, is the Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB, it's a, like a storage, like a database, which can be a, one of five types can be like SQL, which is no core database, it's a JSON database, can be, uh, despite a SQL, can be MongoDB, it means if you have a MongoDB, you must use Cosmos DB. It can be Table API, Gremlin, or Apache Cassandra. Recommended by Microsoft, if you create a new Cosmos DB, is to have like a SQL. It's called SQL API, again, it's a JSON database. This should be used if you have application that will be used throughout the world because just with some clicks you can create a copies of this NoSQL database around the world which copies can be read-write and can be used for applications which will have like millions of users all around the world all for backend mobile APIs because it will be all around the world whenever you want you click can be a read-write uh, read uh, let's say uh, copies of the database it has a concept of partitioning, which is very important topic there, but we will not go there. Again, if you do need your database to be in multiple places all around the world, this is the solution. That is optional thing to enable in multiple regions, but if you have like on-premise MongoDB, you need to migrate there. Again, you have this option in Cosmos DB just to migrate there. Regarding the the synchronization, how fast will happen if you save something in Europe and how fast will be processed, let's say, in USA. For that, we can do by setting up the consistency levels. There are five consistency levels. It means how fast the transactions to be copied in other, let's say, regions. Where we can fine tune this and uh, normally have latency with uh, milliseconds, 10 up to 15 milliseconds. Expensive, but powerful. Another important resource for developers is the Redis cache. Because the database access can take time, those data you can put in Redis cache. This is implementation of, of Apache Redis, implemented here in Azure. And as a such, it's very easy for you developers. Just connection string, get set keys, you can put there for how time will be, and automatically it is more and more faster 
getting data from Redis than from a database. As a such, different tires have different number of connections and different, let's say, size that can save, save there. Despite that, even it is cache, it has, it has in it like a databases like a premium cache has around 20 databases and it happens for special purposes developers want like to have uh, some data in a uh, in one database other data in another database to be and more more optimized here the trick is just with key value key value and within the key we can do some hierarchy like write some name call another name and then we can have some type of the hierarchy uh, we, ha we had such situation in Maersk, the Danish company for containers, where for Cosmos we paid too much money and then we did optimization for less, less money just by saving data here in, uh, in the Redis cache. Another very trendy uh, resource is the Azure Container Registry. Probably you have used the Docker Hub. This is like a Docker Hub, private Docker Hub for our applications where we can create, persist, save, and uh, let's say scan our images. It means in, instead of installing Docker on your computer, you can just send your Docker file to Azure Container Registry. It will build the image and save the image in the Container Registry. Save the image in the Container Registry. As a such, it has another feature that you can buy one container registry. It has option for replication. You can replicate your data images in USA and whenever you want, and then you can reuse that for high availability. The biggest feature is in the build, which I mentioned. We don't need to spend resources for building. We just give to container registry the Docker file. It will build, persist there the data, the images. After having the images, we have two, three options for deploying those images. For dev and test purposes, again, just for dev and test purposes, is the Azure Container Instance. Azure Container Instance is very fast resource. Within a minute, our uh, container image will be up. We'll have its public IP and, uh, let's say, custom domain, but it cannot have a SSL certificate. Again, that's why I said for dev and test, cheap resource. You will have your resources, do, do test there. By default, it supports one container image to deploy. If your application will have multiple images, then you need to use container group, which has like a, two options for deploying that with YAML or with uh, ARM. And again, the most used at the moment, and uh, I can say in the future here, is the Azure Kubernetes service. You probably use the Kubernetes for independently on which, let's say, cloud provider or where. Azure Kubernetes service is managed by Microsoft. We don't pay for the master node. It's managed, upgraded by Microsoft. We pay just for the nodes. The nodes are just the VMs which Microsoft manages. We can have a Windows Linux nodes, and there we can host our, let's say, containerized applications. As such, in this AKS, normally we should uh, enable RBAC, Azure AD RBAC, like to have a, in a level of namespace to have a different authentication authorization. Then all the keys secrets must be saved in a key vault and then en enabling CSI driver, we can connect the key vault with our AKS. Despite that, we should also uh, restrict access to API of this AKS by using IP authorization or by using just private AKS to not be available from outside, which is a very big constraint in big companies. Also, for the by default, pod with pod can communicate, which is not good. That's why we need to enable their network policies to separate communication between pods. We can enable and mesh and Istio, but that's more advanced topic. We should enable the defender for Kubernetes. It should have a backend private connection to the container registry and exposing these applications again through a web application firewall, which can be application gateway or Azure front door. Container images will be, will be scanned in the container registry by using their Azure Defender. Again, this is the 
the reality, but and for the next few years, so this is very interesting resource, very used resource, which is just growing and growing. And this AKS has like automatic scaling and has other features which make the life as developer or DevOps easier. And the last resource here, which for developers maybe can be the most favorite, is the application insight. Application insight can be enabled like codeless or through code. And then in the application insight, you will have in the portal like live view of your application, of your web application. You can see the number of visits. You can see per transactions what requests come, what is sent to them. You can see like a, a map of your applications. You use different resources. It will draw a map. You can create availability test. It will ping your site every some minutes. Despite that, here you can create availability test that will check the SSL certificate expiration. It means automatically will notify you 30 days or more before the SSL certificate will expire. We don't pay for application insight. You will pay just for the logs in the log analytics. It's very powerful for debugging and it's like advanced for developers. I hope I was quick. I wanted to point just the most important topic. And for this session, I hope you had any previous knowledge, let's say, for Azure. Uh, any question, please? Any question regarding the topics that I presented? Yes? Correct, yes. It, correct. In one Azure service bus namespace, that is called Azure service bus namespace, we can have a multiple queues and a multiple topics. It's like a namespace, then multiple. Any other question, please? Correct. Regarding the maximum connection? Yes. Correct. Correct. Yes. Regarding Yes, regarding the flexible, regarding the PostgreSQL, like a single and flexible. In the single one, we have a smaller number of uh, connections we cannot configure. In the flexible, we have up to 5,000. We can configure then how much we want to be. Another topic for the storage. It has a lack that you will start with storage, let's say, 2 gigabytes. Then you cannot go back. You can just double that, like from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16. Another problem that the colleague mentioned is the same in SQL and also in Postgres that when you will reach 100% of your storage, the database will not work. To overcome that issue, you must create alerts to be notified and to manually in this time, uh, uh, let's say, double the size, otherwise it will stop working. Correct. Correct. Correct, and also in flexible server, there is an option for a maintenance. You can define where it will be maintained by, by Microsoft. You can say that I want just on Sunday. And also the flexible server has the option start stop. You can start to pay less money, which in single server you don't have. Again, the usage of PostgreSQL is, is on rise. Any other question, please? Thanks. It was my pleasure. Maybe I spoke somehow faster, but in the, because of the time limitation, I had to do that. Thank you.